Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Yeshiva University and the world of tomorrow. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Glasser, and I have the distinct privilege of serving as the David Mitzner Dean of Yeshiva University Center for the Jewish Future. It is my honor to welcome all of you to this remarkable conference. A special welcome to all of the YU board members, honored rabbis and community leaders, and the students of Yeshiva University who join us this morning. It is a particular pleasure to acknowledge the parents of our Yeshiva University High School for Boys and the doctoral students of Azrieli of the Executive Doctorate in Jewish Educational Leadership and Innovation. Welcome everyone and we are so happy you are here to join us this morning. Yesterday we read the story of Noah, and at the conclusion of this biblical epic we are told Vayita Kerem that Noah plants a vineyard. Vayesht min ayayin vayishkar, and he drank of the wine, and Noach became intoxicated. The inebriated state that Noach was in led to a humiliating episode for our righteous Noach, and the Svas Emes inquires how Noach, someone whose devotion to the service of the divine had been affirmed by the 120 years that he spent constructing the ark at the commandment of God, an individual characterized by the Torah as a tzaddik, as a tamim, as a righteous person, could have acted so irresponsibly as to overindulge and become inappropriately drunk. And the Svasemes answers that Noah, in fact, responsibly drank the precise amount of alcohol that he had always enjoyed for a typical l'chaim. The magnified effect was not because the wine had changed, it was because the world itself had changed. Behaviors that were entirely predictable in the world's previous reality, says the Svas Emes, required a new understanding in Noach's world of tomorrow. As Rabbi Berman stated in his investiture address from this very podium only weeks ago, we live in a rapidly changing world. And Rabbi Berman challenged us to confront that world, to understand it, and to navigate its challenges while embracing its opportunities to ultimately transform our world of tomorrow for the better. It is this vision that has brought us together here today. There are moments when we all feel like we have just stepped off the Teva into an entirely new reality. We look around as the pace and scope of change is so fast and so profound, and we are lost in how to live our lives within the context of this new reality. There is confusion, there is ambiguity in how we relate to our tradition, in how we relate to leadership, in how we relate to education, and in our experience in the marketplace. Assumptions have changed, paradigms have changed, and we have confronted new realities. Today's conference is unlike any experience that we have hosted at Yeshiva University before. Our gathering brings together the vast array of scholars and leaders across the disciplines and schools of our Yeshiva and of our university, joining with colleagues and experts throughout the academic and professional world in confronting the most foundational issues that will shape the future of our community and of our society. Today is our opportunity to step out of the teva, out of the ark, and begin to understand our world of tomorrow. We want to thank the nearly 40 speakers who have generously given of their time and expertise today. Their insight and partnership will continue to strengthen our institution and the broader community. Beyond the sessions and conversations of this conference, today is just the beginning of a larger collective journey in confronting the challenges of tomorrow and ensuring that we can continue to live lives of service to God and to his world through understanding the changes around us and embracing them as opportunities for greatness. To that end, Yeshiva University has launched only moments ago a new initiative called YU Ideas. A few minutes ago or momentarily you will receive an email inviting you to explore a new website hosted by the Office of the President. This, initi this initiative will leverage the YU community's vast interdisciplinary resources 
to stimulate conversations on some of the most important issues facing the world at large. The site will host a monthly edition that will tackle a new topic relating to one of the themes of our conference, education, marketplace, leadership, and values. You will find a remarkable array of essays and videos and other creative presentations. The first topic under discussion on the YU Ideas site relates to artificial intelligence. And there you will find the context and the content to better understand and engage our changing world. Most importantly, we invite you to contribute to the site and broaden the conversation. We welcome your ideas regarding topics and issues you would like to see our scholars and faculty address. And together, we will lead our community and broader society into the future. I would like to conclude by thanking the many people who have worked for months to make this conference such a success. The staff of the CJF, the events office and CPA office led by Eliza Berenholtz, the Office of Institutional Advancement, and the President's Office have all worked tireless, tirelessly to create this remarkable experience. After our program, we will all proceed to Belfer Hall for two breakout sessions. After the second one concludes, we will reconvene together in Weisberg Commons on the first floor of that building to hear concluding thoughts from Rabbi Berman in his presidential address. From there, everyone is invited to enjoy the many lunch options available in Tenzer Gardens and throughout the campus. We begin this morning with a conversation about the world of tomorrow between an international religious leader, philosopher, and award-winning author, and a young, dynamic, brilliant thinker who represents the leaders that YU is producing to confront the world of tomorrow. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs served as the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth for 22 years. Rabbi Sachs has held a number of professorships at several academic institutions, including Yeshiva University and King's College in London. His impact ranges far beyond the Jewish community, serving as a moral voice throughout the world. Rabbi Sachs will be engaging in conversation together with Rabbi Ari Lam, who earned a BA from Yeshiva University, an MA from University College London and the School of Oriental and African Studies via a Fulbright Scholarship and Rabbinic Ordination from the Rabbi Isaac Alchanan Theological Seminary. Rabbi Lam, Rabbi Ari Lam, embodies the insight and the energy that characterizes so many of the future leaders being produced by Yeshiva University. It is my privilege to welcome them both to the stage. Thank you so much. Briefly, a, 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 um, a story. Several years ago, when I lived in London, I was asked to speak at one of the local synagogues for Shavuot. And after all of the local synagogues and educations of Jewish uh, and, and institutions of Jewish education had concluded sending out their invitations, the community published a master list of all the speakers who would be speaking. Now. The shuls several weeks before Shavuot announced the entire master list, and of course, Lord Sachs, who was chief rabbi at the time, was given pride of place at the end. It happened to be that by coincidence, my name appeared before his, and so in one of the synagogues in which I was attending several weeks before Shavuot, when they made the announcement, they announced, and Rabbi Lamb will speak in place X, and Rabbi Sachs will speak in place Y. Now, most people in the synagogue knew that by Rabbi Lamb, they didn't mean the Rabbi Lamb, they meant me. But I'll never forget the fellow behind me, who clearly did not know, and turned to his friend and said, wow, Rabbi Lamb in one place, Rabbi Sachs in the other, how are we ever going to choose? At which point I turned around and said, gentlemen, I'm about to make your decision very easy. <laughs> so it is an immense honor and a pleasure to have with us this morning Lord Sachs, 
one of the great renowned thinkers and theologians, not just in the Jewish community, but of course, throughout intellectual communities uh, in the world. And so, without further ado, I'd like us all to welcome Lord Sachs. <clears throat> In the modern Orthodox world in which I was raised, the task often for which we seem to be being prepared, a noble task to be sure, was to mine the glory and the grandeur of the world around us for enrichment so that we could better our own sense of avodat Hashem, of service to God. But now as the world changes so rapidly around us, the time seems ripe to draw upon another major theme in Jewish tradition, and that is the manner in which Judaism, possessed as it is of a deep and profound tradition of law, wisdom, and philosophy, can contribute to the world around us. And so I'd like to begin uh, this conversation by exploring the, the, the issues that are facing not just the Jewish community, but facing all of humanity, and begin to frame ways in which we might think about the world of tomorrow. So the first question I have is this. We live in an ideological world in which Increasingly, the divide seems to be between those who emphasize global relationships and those who put emphasis on a strong sense of national identity. And the Jewish people have straddled the border between those things because Jewish communities have transcended national borders throughout most of history and also have a very particular identity. So how do Jews fit within this world divided between such poles and how can we be value added in that world? Well, first of all, Rabbi Lam, thank you and thank all this wonderful audience. And uh, let me begin by saying what a privilege it is to be able to wish again your new Kvod uh, Rabbi Ari Berman, this blessing and success in this incredible task, more than the future of uni Yeshiva University as it is at stake, the future of orthodoxy, the future of the Jewish voice in America, of it, the Jewish voice globally is in your hands and the hands of your incredible academic staff and your truly outstanding students. So may Hashem give you strength and in the immortal words of whoever, go for it. <laughs> uh, second, let me tell you in case you didn't guess already in the first 30 seconds, you have a total superstar in young Rabbi Ari Lam. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to say in intellect he's a lion, and in midot he's a lamb, and he manages to combine them both very carefully and very beautifully. Um, Ari, the, the um, equation was wrong to begin with. We, by all means, we learn from the world. But our mission was to teach the world. It was not to stand in awe of these great achievements. The fact is that probably the greatest culture and civilization that ever existed, the Greece of Athens, that became the Greece of Alexander the Great, and yet it died a death, and we didn't die a death. And therefore, there was something that even the great tradition of Herodotus and Thucydides, the historians, the philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, of the tragedians, Aeschylus and Sophocles, there was something there that Greece didn't get and that we gave the world via, as it happens, Christianity, which was a hybrid of the two and not always one that was fair to or respectful of the parent from which it came. And that is all the more true now. The West is in a very, very fateful moment. I don't know if you've noticed this. Have you noticed this? I was saying that in the 19th century, Hegel said that modern man has substituted reading the daily press in place of morning prayer. Nowadays, if you read the daily press, you need morning prayer. <laughs> so here we are with the rise of <clears throat> suppression of free speech in universities in the name of safe spaces. 
You have identity politics. You have competitive victimhood. You have the rise of populism throughout the West to levels that have not been seen since the early 1930s. The West is in a mess. And the truth is we have a responsibility here. Look at the average length of superpowers in the world. What, Spain in the 15th century, Venice in the 16th, Holland in the 17th, France in the 18th, England 19th, United States in the 20th. The average shelf life of a superpower is 100 years. We've been around 40 times that long. Whether or not we have Seichel, we certainly have experience. You name any crisis in the world, we have been there before, and we came out of it saying, as Yaakov Avinu said to the angel, Lo ki im berachtani. I will not let you go until somehow out of this crisis I have discovered and created a blessing. This is an extraordinarily powerful thing. And to begin with, what is absolutely unique about Judaism that was not remotely borrowed from it by either Christianity or Islam, both of whom borrowed so much from us, failed to borrow the very issue that you raise. What do we concern ourselves with, the universal or the particular? And the short answer is Judaism is the only religion, the only civilization in the world that has had precise commitments to both. The Brit B'nai Noach that we read about in Shul yesterday is a universal covenant, what I call the covenant of human solidarity, the terms of human existence. The Brit with Avram Avinu, which we read at the end of next week's parasha, was a covenant of particularity, of locality, of this people, not all people. The God of Israel is the God of all humanity. The religion of Israel is not the religion of all humanity. Why? because these are the right and left hemispheres of the human brain, the systole and diastole of human breathing. We need both a universal vision and a particular identity, what I call in one of my books the universality of justice and the particularity of love. In the 21st century, countries and individuals are going to have to think global and act local. A strong sense of human solidarity, but at the same time an unbreakable sense that this is me, this is my history, this is my story, this is who I am. I'm not humanity in general, I am this particular sliver of humanity, this color in the spectrum, this voice in the conversation. So because the world is torn between these two, Judaism must go out and show how it's not an either or but a both and. Speaking of thinking locally or the particularity, <clears throat> what does it mean to be part of a community nowadays? On the Jewish end, you can think of a person whose closest <clears throat> rabbinic teacher lives in Israel, whose friends live on either the East Coast or the West <clears throat> Coast, and you may live in the Midwest. So can we still speak of a local Jewish community or in the broader general sense? You may think of a person in the world of tomorrow who's, or in the world of today whose employer is working remotely from Spain, whose colleagues don't even live anywhere, they switch Airbnbs every six months, and who communicates with their best friends primarily over Skype or over FaceTime. So what in the world of today is the advantage, or is it even possible to think locally? What is local community? Now? Well, local community is actually dealt with for the in Psalm number one. To be strong, you need roots somewhere. Whereas the Rishaim, we won't call them wicked, we'll call them just alienated or destabilized, are like chaff blown on the wind. And that's what Facebook culture actually is. You know, whatever is this week's fashion or this week's viral video. I mean, you don't have grinning cats on, do you? I mean, or whatever it is this week. I don't know. You know, this is Kamotsa Shetit Venoroach. This is being blown this way and that. That is not an identity. So um, here it is. In 2011, a British medical charity, Macmillan Nurses, did a survey of young Brits between the ages of 18 and 30. This is 2011, six years ago, 
which in the history of Facebook is quite something because Facebook just had its bar mitzvah. It's been around for 13 years. It has 2 billion subscribers. So six years ago, it was, you know, it was in, still in Cheda, you know. And they asked, the, how, how many Facebook friends do you have? And the average answer six years ago was 237. When asked, how many of those can you rely on in an emergency, the average answer was two. A quarter said one, an eighth said none. That is the difference between a Facebook friend and a real friend. The guy you sit next to in shul, or even better, the guy you don't speak to in shul. But <laughs> so I was doing a, a, a Facebook Live a, couple of, a, a week or two ago with the head of Facebook in Europe, Nicola Mendelssohn, who I have to tell you is an Orthodox and practicing Jew. And we were talking just that because Mark Zuckerberg has changed the mission statement of Facebook to supporting communities. And the truth is, yes, Facebook can support communities, but it can't create communities. Communities have to be down here on the ground. That's why you need a minion. That's why you don't drive on Shabbos so Orthodox Jews live in close proximity to one another. You need those things. And you need face-to-face -face encounters. And therefore, we came up with this wonderful idea of a digital detox. You know what I mean? In order not to be totally dependent on your smartphone. And my smartphone is a lot smarter than I am, so I've already got an inferiority <laughs> complex. And I haven't <laughs> even bought the iPhone X yet, so I mean... <laughs> I should be completely inadequate then. But the point <laughs> is, the fact is that one day a week, you've got to switch off the iPhone and meet real people in real time and real space. And I propose, let's call it Shabbos. <laughs> so, and I think Mark Zuckerberg, and bless him, Mark and, and Sheryl Sandberg, both, this Yom Kippur, came out of the closet and and, and send a Yom Kippur message, Khatasi or Visi Poshati, to which everyone said, you're absolutely right, you really did. And uh, <laughs> so here it is. All these technologies can support community, but they can't create and sustain community. And for that, you need physical presence, I thou, and there's no substitute for it. My daughter is six years old and thinking about inviting two billion people to her bat mitzvah is already making me sweat. The, moving to the, the context of education, of course we're in a university, primarily and paradigmatically an educational institution. The oldest university in existence is the University of Bologna, founded in 1088, and in its operations it's essentially identical to the manner in which a modern university operates. Students file into a classroom, a professor gives a lecture, students take notes and then retire to their homes either in or around campus. A thousand years ago that was the case, a thousand years later it's still the case. Now, for the first time in a millennium, there are possibilities for new models of education that incorporate distance or what have you. So what opportunities and challenges are present here? And for Judaism, a tradition that is ver veritably obsessed with pedagogy, <clears throat> what role do we have? What contributions can we make to this conversation? Well, the first contribution we can make is to point out what I haven't seen anyone else point out, is that all the great leaps, the quantum leaps in civilization and spirituality have occurred as a result of or coincident, coincident with a revolution in information technology. The, the invention of writing in Mesopotamia uh, was coincident with the birth of civilization. Because for the first time with writing, human accumulated wisdom could exceed the content of a single human memory. Judaism was born in the second revolution of information technology, the birth of the alphabet. The first alphabet, proto-Semitic or proto-Sinaitic, discovered in Sarabit in the Sinai Desert by the turquoise mines by Flinders Petrie, the British archaeologist in 1903. And um, it is linearly the, the father or the grandfather of all alphabetical systems. 
once you reduce the sum total of knowledge, not from hundreds and thousands of symbols, but 22 characters, you can for the first time conceive of a society of universal literacy and hence of the dignity of every single individual. The birth of the idea of one God singular and alone leads to the idea of the infinite value of one human being singular and alone. Uh, Christianity, now I'm going on a leap here, but Christianity coincides with the use of the codex, i.e. books with pages as opposed to scrolls. Codices preceded Christianity, but nobody used them very much. Jews and Greeks both used scrolls. Whereas the Christians were the first systematic users of codices, and that's why the New Testament has a different structuring principle to it, than Tanakh has. The Reformation and uh, led, uh, sorry, the Reformation was the result of a revolution in information technology, Gutenberg and Caxton, the invention of printing, all the ideas put forward by Martin Luther, and don't forget this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation when he nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. All of those had been thought through by John Wycliffe at Oxford two centuries earlier, but John Wycliffe of Oxford didn't have printing, so they remain local, whereas Luther's were printed in their hundreds of thousands. So now we are going through one of the greatest information technology revolutions of all time, and we as Jews know, or we should know, that every such revolution is kol dodido fake Hashem knocking at our door saying, use this, lahagdil Torah ulahadira to make, to spread Torah in ways we couldn't have spread it before. It's made for a small scattered people like we are. It was made for this, but it's made for taking a Jewish message to the world. So if you have a chance to look at our website, no, there's free advertising here, why not? Uh, but we have been experimenting now with the use of this, whiteboard animations, a uh, little, you see, we're just at the beginning, we're look, experimenting with all sorts of different formats on the web, and I think why you should be in the forefront of this, go global. But the fact remains that you still need, you still need that either relationship, face to face with academic colleagues and above all with teachers. That's what made Oxford and Cambridge different because you sat on a one-to-one -one with your tutor, because you went to lectures and so on. Now, we know that uh, some things have been a success. 23 million Chinese have watched Michael Sandel's Harvard uh, lectures, uh, Justice 101. So some of them have been successful, but there was this feeling that these MOOCs, massive online, what, what's a MOOC actually? open online courses it would revolutionize education, but you know the latest research is that, uh, that the dropout rate is massive, and this thought that you could do it all by distance learning is actually not the case. Now, distance learning was what Chazal had, but then they brought everyone together for Chodesh Elul. So I don't think you will ever get away from this either relationship with the Rav and with Chaverim, and that's the glory of Jewish education. You want the biggest culture shock there ever was. I, you know, the British Library, total silence. Somebody coughs, you're in, consigned to at least a year in the other place, you know. I mean, total silence. So I was studying at Cambridge, University Library, complete silence. You go to yesh a yeshiva-based madrash, Everyone's standing and a thousand people shouting at the top of their voices. And that is Jewish learning. You know, it's not passive, it's active. The Archbishop of Canterbury, back in 1999, said to me, Jonathan, we've decided as a church to make this the year of Bible reading. Do you think you can get the Jewish community to join us? I said, oh, George, of course, will do it. Well, I promise you we will read the Bible every week for the whole coming year. <laughs>
I said, but there's only one word I find difficult in that request, and that's the word read. <laughs> we don't read the Bible, we inhale the Bible, we wrestle with the Bible, we argue it, we counter comment and counter comment. You know, for us, we live the Bible, we don't just read it. So you will never get away from that essential human contact with a teacher and with a chaver, and those things are essential, but the augmentation and the expansion of reach you can get for this through this technology is stunning. And do you know what about thing about this technology? Computers are infinitely patient. I'm sure you've only ever had infinitely patient teachers. But for me, who have not always had infinitely patient teachers, a computer is so nice. And I have this thing on my phone called Siri. Do you have that here in? Who's the nicest of the nice? I don't think the New York Siri is the same as the English one, because the English one is exactly like a British civil servant. You know, you ask it, Siri, who do you love? And it replies, oh, this is supposed to be about you, not about me. <laughs> and then I said, Siri, tell me, tell me honestly, does God exist? And it replied to me, I kid you not. Uh, well, it's all a bit of a mystery to me. <laughs> So this is great technology, but you will never lose the need for personal contact with a Rav and with Chaveri. Whenever I ask Siri questions about who she loves, I usually end up ordering soap. So it's not <laughs> sure how Siri works exactly. But he, uh, in his, his investiture address, Dr. Berman laid out five Torot, five core values that define our mission as a university, one of which was Torah Met, a commitment to truth. And as you discussed earlier in the world of today, thank you, the intellectual currents that are swirling around us, truth, to an extent, one might get the impression, has become passé. So is an intellectual tradition that believes in truth at an advantage or a disadvantage in the world of tomorrow? Well, it's our unique selling proposition, isn't it? I mean, let everyone else be post-truth. And since you can't live without truth, everyone will come to Yeshiva University because it's the last city of refuge for this orphaned virtue. The fact is uh, that this uh, post-truth age, which is the fag end of postmodernism, guys, you know what postmodernism is. You know that famous remark, what's the difference between the mafia and a postmodernist? The mafia make you an offer you can't refuse, and a postmodernist makes you an offer you can't understand. So this ridiculous culture, which was a kind of decadent and mutant form of Nietzscheanism and the will to power, um, is, is really a reductio ad absurdum of what always was a mistaken thing. The truth is that Nietzsche, who is my favorite atheist, because, you know, he was a man of truth in a, in a sense, he wrote a book entitled The Gay Science. The word gay didn't mean then what it means today, but it's a book called The Gay Science in which he says, don't think once you lose religious faith that science will be sufficient to make truth of value. Truth is only of value because of the religious roots of Western civilization. And he's right. Truth does not necessarily give you an evolutionary advantage. If you can tell lies and get away with it, you will win the survivalist lottery. Plato believed that society might have to be built on the big lie. Whereas Jews, and indeed this is part of the shared Jewish Christian heritage, believed that truth is the signature of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it's what we have to aim for if we want to be like him. Only where there is truth is there trust. Only where there is trust can there be a strong and good and free society. So this disenchantment with truth is a sure sign that a certain kind of postmodernism is reaching its end because there is simply no way that, that this can go. It's just dug its own grave. I'd like to play a little game called Underrated Overrated where I'd like to throw out something, a thing, a person, a topic to you, and I'd like you to um, opine on whether you think it's overrated, properly rated, or underrated, and of course, feel free to pass. Uh, the first one is underrated, overrated, modern orthodoxy. <laughs> Start slow. 
The, the phrase modern orthodoxy is overrated to the nth degree. I urge you to find another label. Let me tell you why. Number one, as you've already worked out, nothing is less modern than modern. Are you with me? I mean, in the 1960s, we were modern. By the 1970s, we were already postmodern. And then now we're into retro, which is the modern form of being before modern. So just ditch. Modern orthodoxy classic. Yeah, they just ditch the modern, you know. It, it just doesn't do anything for anyone. It's like, it's like the word congregant. Do you know the word congregant in the Oxford English Dictionary? It tells us it's only used by Jews. Or like the word decorum. Did you, do you remember the days when there was decorum? Only Jews ever spoke about it, you know. Everyone else just did it. We spoke about it, you know. So um, the word modern is terrible, but let me remind you what is wrong with that phrase. If you in America get up and say, I am a modern Orthodox Jew, you have just defined yourself as a minority of a minority of a minority. Because in America, Jews are a minority. Among American Jews, Orthodox Jews are a minority. And among Orthodox Jews, modern Orthodox Jews are a minority. You have just painted yourself into a corner that is not even Daladamas by Daladamas. How did I define us? I said we are the Judaic voice in the conversation of humankind. And the second we did that, we were part of the majority. I was a voice on the BBC in the British press, and we did at least as well with non-Jews as with Jews. And when non-Jews see Jew, when Jews see non-Jews appreciating Judaism, they say, "Hang on, if the guy like this, maybe there's something in it after all." <laughs> so I would urge you to just ditch it totally. I. I actually coined the phrase of Judaism engaged with the world, but you'll find a better phrase. But one way or another, this is a phrase that has long passed its sell-by date. And if you continue to use it, you will endlessly find yourself arguing, are we to, how many degrees are we to the right of open orthodoxy? How many degrees to the left of Haredi orthodoxy? and you will land up with what Sigmund Freud rather nicely called the narcissism of small differences, or what in Hasidus they call katnut de mochin. You know, I mean, it's just, you're bigger than that. We are part of a tradition that's twice as old as Christianity, three, th three times as old as Islam, that has survived every superpower that ever sought to destroy us, that is still young, still full of energy and ideas, we deserve something better than modern orthodoxy. Could we, Mr. President, offer some prize <laughs> to anyone who can come up with a better phrase than modern orthodoxy, okay? You'll announce that in your next whatever it is, right. <laughs> Underrated, overrated, interfaith dialogue. Uh, I am really and truly not a fan of interfaith dialogue. I'll tell you why. Interfaith dialogue takes place among very liberal-minded people. I don't mean liberal in the sense of reformed Jews or Unitarians, but very open-minded people, usually halfway up a mountain, you know, in some benign, beautiful environment, and you sit together for a week in these lovely surroundings, and you work out, yeah, yeah he's a good guy, he's a good guy. And it's, it's terrific. Then you get down to street level, it, it disappears faster than the sun does in England. You know, I mean, it, it, it's high level, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really deliver. And therefore, uh, I wrote a book about this called The Home We Build Together, and I used two phrases based, I have to say, on the typology of, of the Rav in The Lonely Man of Faith, which I called face-to-face -face and side-by-side. -side. Interfaith is face-to-face. -face. We're both talking about what we believe. But side-by-side -side is Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs working together to solve at street level some problem that all those communities face in common.
It may be graffiti on the walls. It may be drug dealers on the streets. It may be, you know, we do this in, in England. We have a mitzvah day in which not only Jews, but Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs all take part. One year I'll be painting the walls of a hospice because they couldn't afford decorators. Mind you, after they saw my results, they probably decide to raise money for the real thing anyway. But at any rate, but we're side by side. And what comes out of that? Friendship. And sometimes friendship is what you need. Not theological agreement, simple friendship. So I am in favor of interfaith activity through social action side by side is more powerful than face by face. The entire world feels like it's changing as rapidly as one can imagine. The Jewish community in many ways feels as if it's at a crossroads. Yeshiva University is about to enter into a new era. And so at this propitious time, if you could see Yeshiva University play a role in the Jewish community, in the world, what would that role be? <clears throat> I, I think you can define it fairly precisely. You know the demographic projections for American Jewry. And I'm not making any denominational point here. But according to the Pew survey of November 9th, 2013, outside of orthodoxy, the outmarriage rate was running then at 71%. The only really growth areas, the only one is orthodoxy. The end result is, if you do the demographic projections, 25 years from now, America will be a dominantly orthodox community, which has, has not been since 1880. So Yeshiva University will have the challenge of providing leadership, not just for the orthodox community, but for the American Jewish community as a whole. And when it does so, I hope it will do a little better than spend all our time working out that the Goyim hate us. You know, the isolation of Israel, the existence of anti-Semitism. They are real, but they are incredibly negative. And if that's all our kids learn about, they will not want to be Jews. Here's an even scarier statistic, and it came out from a Pew report three weeks ago. Young American Jews, 30 years and younger, when asked, what religion are you, 53% say none. Now, if that is not a spiritual failure, I don't know what is. And work out when these things are happening. We know that this is the worst of possible worlds. Uh, everyone hates us, and white supremacists in Charlottesville, and jihadists in Barcelona, and Iran, and Hamas, and Hezbollah. We know this stuff. But for heaven's sake, we've been around for 4,000 years. Tell me any other time in those 200 generations of our ancestors when we had simultaneously sovereignty and independence in the state and land of Israel and freedom and equality in the diaspora. Every prayer of our Bubas and Zaydas and their Bubas and Zaydas has been answered and what are Jews doing with it? Walking away. I mean, Gewalt. Abba Iban was right. We are the people who can't take yes for an answer. I want to see Yeshiva University go out there and deliver an intellectually powerful message to the world. You just mentioned the first thing you're going to deal with is artificial intelligence. I have to tell you, I met just a couple of months ago with three Haredim of the Ada Haredit in Yushalayim who are doing the, the morality program for the artificial intelligence for autonomous self-driving vehicles. You know, if, if the vehicle is on an a, a icy road and it's skidding and there are two cyclists it could bump into and one's wearing a helmet and the other one isn't, which do you choose to bump into? Obviously, mitzadech, how do you choose to bump into the one wearing a safety helmet because he may survive where the other one won't? Mitzadcheni, you're penalizing the one who's doing what he ought to do, wearing a safety belt, and rewarding the guy who's flouting the law by not wearing it. 
Now, you ask the geeks in Stanford and Palo Alto to work that one out, they don't know what, how, where to begin. You ask guys who spend the whole day learning Gomorrah, of course, yeah, sure, this is so good, let's work. You know, so it's terrific. But even more important, what makes our intelligence special? What makes humans human? What makes us but salmenu kidmutenu? I don't know if you've read Yuval Harari's second book, not Sapiens, but Homo Deus. If you get to the end, right at the end, he says, what counts? What makes us human? Is it consciousness or is it intelligence? If it's intelligence, we've lost already. I was, already, I was at TED this year in Vancouver with Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, who 20 years ago was beaten by IBM's Deep Blue. So in a world of artificial intelligence, what makes us but Salamalokian? Now that's a good question. I'm not going to give you the answer. You work it out for yourself. <laughs> but that's what non-Jews are hungry for. And I repeat, you deliver that in the Wall Street Journal. The Haredim will love it, and the Chilonim will love it. It's the only, th you know, it will suddenly say, oh, now I understand, you know, we've been learning Gemara for all these thousands of years. Now I know, because modern life is throwing up these dilemmas of sp such specificity and complexity that were made for a Talmudic mind. And that, I think, is number one, intellectual rigor. Number two, let us not be bashful about this, real spirituality. This is what, 50 years since the Rav published, 52 years, 53 years, The Lonely Man of Faith. What major theological, spiritual statement has come from us in those 50 years? It's all great and wonderful to quote the Rosh Yeshiva from uh, 100 years ago. But, you know, you know, each, each generation has to make its own chatzot srots. Each generation has to provide its own judges because we are the timeless but set in time. What is spirituality for this generation, for the Facebook generation? We're experimenting with this. We put out 10 little four-minute videos from sort of slichah, first night slichahs to Erev Yom Kippur, just to begin seeing, can we deliver spirituality in four minutes on a YouTube video? I, I'm not sure that we succeeded, but we're going to work on this. And maybe you can only do spirituality in the flesh, you know, maybe you can only do it with a Kabbalah Shabbat or a Febreng or something. So, aim high. And aim for powerful intellectual rigor and real spirituality, but don't aim yourself at a narrow audience. Try and speak to the universal and the particular. Try and speak to as wide an audience as you can get, and you will find that you're getting deeper and deeper into our bedrock humanity. And when you do that, the words carry conviction and authority. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, no, I think we've just... I think, I think instead I'm going to ask ladies and gentlemen here to be uh, very kind in thanking Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs for joining us this morning. Thank you.